All right, everybody, I'm Logan Alec, I'm a CPA, and in this video, I wanna talk about a misconception that I think a lot of people have. I don't know exactly why this misconception exists, but it does. And this misconception is that if you make a lot of money and you need a way to reduce your tax bill in a jiffy, you could just buy a rental property. And somehow, through some kind of tax magic or voodoo, a CPA or other tax pro can somehow take that rental property and save you a bunch of taxes as a result, so you pay less in taxes. I see this misconception constantly online. For example, there's a real estate investing website called Bigger Pockets uh, that I used to be quite active in, maybe five, six years ago. On Bigger Pockets, there are a lot of forums that people can ask real estate questions on to the Bigger Pockets uh, community at large and get answers. So I used to provide a lot of information and answers to people there on their tax questions pertaining to real estate and rentals, and I got a lot of clients that way. One thing I would see pop up all the time is, hey, I make a lot of money at my job, but I'm just getting killed in taxes. I heard that I can buy real estate and it'll reduce my tax bill dramatically. How does this work? Like for example, here's a post. The guy said, my fiance paid over $150,000 in taxes from her W-2 job. Would buying passive income like a multifamily property offset her taxes? Later he said her CPA claims she has no write-offs other than her property taxes and normal homeowner stuff. A buddy of mine said if we get $3 million worth of real estate that her taxes could literally be zero through cost segregation. I see questions like this all over the internet, in Facebook groups, on Reddit, in forums like this. People ask, hey, I need to save on taxes, what should I do? And most of the time, or much of the time, someone will chime in, buy real estate, as if they know what they're talking about. So I'm here to set the record straight in this video. I don't want to make this a boring tax lecture, so I'm gonna explain the concepts I want to cover as I go through with examples. I'm first gonna give you an example of a taxpayer who buys a rental property, uh, rents it out, takes all the appropriate deductions, reports them correctly on their tax return, right? They calculate depreciation correctly, and nevertheless, that rental property makes absolutely no difference in their tax liability for the year. What? Yeah. Then I'm gonna give you an example of a taxpayer who buys a rental property, but it does actually cause them to pay less in taxes this year. Then at the end of the video, I'm going to give you an example of a taxpayer who buys a rental property and accounts for it correctly on their tax return. But in this taxpayer scenario, the rental property actually generates a tax liability for them. And hopefully, as I go through these examples, you can figure out which bucket you're in and which example you relate to the most. By the way, if you are a real estate investor and you want to talk taxes and real estate with me, if you're looking for a CPA, feel free to email me real estate at loganalk.com. Serious inquiries only, please. Ideally, you already have a real estate investment or two under your belt, or you're dead set on purchasing one in the very near future and have the money set aside to do so. All right, let's get into it. Example number one is a taxpayer who buys a rental property and it doesn't do anything to his tax liability this year. Doesn't make it go up, doesn't make it go down, just stays the same as though he didn't buy the rental. So let's say this taxpayer buys a rental property, let's say a single family home for $150,000. Let's say, just to use round numbers here, let's say this property generates $1,000 of rent a month. And I'm just making these numbers up, by the way, just to illustrate the example. I'm not saying these are actual numbers anywhere right now, but let's say uh, the monthly rent's $1,000. Let's say the monthly mortgage payment, which includes principal, interest, taxes, and insurance is, I don't know, $600 a month. And this property's other expenses, things like property manager's fees and repairs and supplies and maybe an average of CapEx and vacancies. Let's say the other expenses are, I don't know, I'm just trying to use easy numbers here, $300 a month on average. Okay, it might be a little low, but look, again, I'm just making these numbers up. So if we take the $1,000 in rent a month, less a $600 uh, monthly payment to the bank, less than $300 a month in average other expenses, that leaves us with $100 a month in cash flow. Okay, so let's just roll with this. So in real economic terms, right, this rental is generating for the taxpayer $100 a month in cash flow, not even including principal pay down, cash flow, which is $1,200 a year, okay? But that's not what we would put on our tax return. For one thing, we would have to add back the principal payment on the mortgage because you can't deduct principal payments. And because we're early on the mortgage, uh, the principal pay down is probably really low uh, because most of the payments earlier on go mostly toward interest. That's just how mortgage amortization works. Uh, so let's say the monthly principal pay down on average for the first year here is $200 a month. And then from that, we also have to subtract uh, non-cash expenses like depreciation. So I'm not gonna get into the details of the calculation here. Um, I plan on doing a dedicated video on depreciation in the future, but you can see my little back of the napkin depreciation calculation on screen here. Uh, basically the monthly depreciation expense with the assumptions, the assumptions I've laid out would come to $341 a month. I also threw in a little bit of amortization uh, this is amortization on loan costs, right? Loan costs on the mortgage would be amortized over the length of the loan. 
I just put in $9 a month to get a nice round number here because the depreciation figure was odd. Uh, so basically we take our monthly cash flow of $100 a month, add back the monthly principal pay down, subtract depreciation expense and subtract amortization expense, we come up with a $50 monthly loss for tax purposes, largely due to depreciation. So if we multiply that $50 monthly loss by 12, we get a $600 annual loss for tax purposes. And this is what the taxpayer would report on Schedule E of their tax return. So why is it uh, that this $600 loss generated by this rental property doesn't help the taxpayer's tax situation this year in this first example? Well, first, let me tell you a little bit about the taxpayer, okay? And just generally speaking, people in this bucket are oftentimes highly compensated, maybe, you know, managerial level employees, well compensated sales professionals or business owners who are doing fairly well for themselves. And by fairly well in this context, I mean, they make at least $150,000 a year. That, that's a magic number here that you have to keep in mind. I'll tell you why in a bit. So let's say this taxpayer here makes $150,000 a year at their job um, as an engineer, right? And let's assume that's their only income other than the real estate, of course. So even though this taxpayer has a $600 rental loss showing on Schedule E, a loss largely caused by depreciation, this taxpayer can't deduct that loss against their other income, okay? It, it does nothing to affect their tax liability this year. Their tax liability is the same this year whether they bought that rental property or not. Why? Because of something called the passive activity loss rules. Due to these rules, you can't deduct passive losses, such as a loss on a rental property against your non-passive income, like the money you make at your job. That's a general rule. There are exceptions, for example, if you're a real estate professional for tax purposes, I will make a video specifically uh, about that classification. But in this situation, our taxpayer is not a real estate professional. They have a full-time job as an engineer, and given that fact alone, it is pretty much impossible for this taxpayer to qualify as a real estate professional because they'd have to spend more time doing real estate than their job, which is not arguable for one single family home. Anyway, another exception to this general passive activity loss rule is that if you actively participate in a passive rental real estate activity, like let's say a single family home here, you might be able to deduct up to $25,000 worth of passive losses against your non-passive income for the year, with the rest being carried forward to future years. But you can't make too much money in order to qualify for this exception. The IRS says the maximum special allowance of $25,000 is reduced by 50% of the amount of your modified adjusted gross income that's more than $100,000. Therefore, if your modified adjusted and gross income is $150,000 or more, you generally can't use a special allowance. So this is saying if your modified adjusted gross income is $100,000 or less, okay, and that's the same amount for single as for married filing jointly, it doesn't double for marrieds, right? So this is kind of an example of a marriage penalty. So if your modified adjusted gross income this year is $100,000 or less, then you can deduct up to $25,000 in passive losses from rental real estate activities you actively participate in. But for every dollar, in modified adjusted gross income, you have over $100,000. And this figure excludes the real estate loss itself, by the way. So for every dollar in modified adjusted gross income, you have over $100,000 for the year. This $25,000 potential special allowance, the exception to the rule, is reduced by 50 cents. So if you make uh, $120,000, say, then you're over the $100,000 limit by $20,000. 50 cents times $20,000 is $10,000. $25,000 subtract $10,000 is $15,000. So you could only deduct a maximum of $15,000 of passive real estate losses uh, against your active income this year, assuming you actively participate in the real estate activity. And just doing the math, once your income hits $150,000, that $25,000 allowance uh, would be zero right? So uh, you could not deduct any passive real estate losses against your active income. And this modified adjusted gross income figure, okay, uh, it is, as it sounds, based on adjusted gross income, not taxable income. So it's not decreased by your standard deduction or itemized deductions or, uh, or your QBI deduction. So in our case, our taxpayer makes $150,000 a year at the engineering job. Therefore, they cannot deduct any of these largely depreciation generated real estate losses against their ordinary active income. So what happens to these losses? Are they lost forever? No. They are carried forward indefinitely to be applied against future passive income or potentially released, say, if the asset is disposed of. I do want to make a video in the future about the ins and outs of the passive activity loss rules. There's a lot more to say about them. But for now, let's put example number one to rest here. This poor taxpayer who can't use the real estate losses this year against their other income and whose rental property made no difference whatsoever to their tax liability this year, but they still got cash flow 
principal pay down and appreciation. Now let's talk about the second taxpayer, the example of a taxpayer who does get a tax benefit this year for the rental tax loss. So we can assume the same rental property, but let's say this taxpayer, instead of making $150,000 a year, let's say they make um, $148,000 a year and they actively participate in this rental activity as well. Well, this taxpayer can deduct the entire $600 rental loss against their W-2 income this year. Why? Because just to do the math again really quickly, the special allowance to deduct real estate losses against your ordinary income is $25,000, right? That's, that's the maximum possible. This is reduced by 50 cents on the dollar for every dollar your income excuse $100,000, excluding the real estate loss. Our second taxpayer here makes $148,000, right? So $148,000 less $100,000 is $48,000. $48,000 times 50 cents on the dollar is $24,000. Uh, and $25,000 minus $24,000 is $1,000. So this taxpayer could deduct up to $1,000 of real estate losses against his ordinary income for this year. And this particular property generate a $600 loss as we calculated in the first example. That's less than $1,000. So this taxpayer can deduct all of that loss against their W-2 income. So even though this, cash pay, uh, this taxpayer cash flowed $1,200 for the year on this property, they still get a tax deduction for $600 on this property. How much is that worth in real dollars? Well, assuming this taxpayer is single and they're in the 24% tax bracket for federal income tax purposes, well, we just do the math here, 24% times $600 is $144. So this rental property reduced the taxpayer's federal tax liability by $144 and possibly reduced their state tax liability as well if they have one. Now let's talk about a situation where a rental property would actually cause you to pay more in taxes. And this scenario is quite simple. It's simply that even with depreciation, your rental property still has taxable income. So what if, um, let's say in five years, rental market's really gone up, right? Instead of charging a thousand a month, uh, you know, let's say taxpayer number two, for example, starts charging uh, 12, let's just say $1,100 a month, right? He hasn't refinanced or anything. He's got a fixed rate mortgage. So principal and interest payments the same. Uh, maybe taxes and insurance have gone up a bit. So instead of $600 for expenses, let's say it's $625. Let's say the other expenses are the same as well. Realistically, maybe the property manager is collecting a little more now, right? If their fee is based on rent. So maybe we can increase the other expenses by say 10 bucks a month. Okay, let, 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 let's do that. Um, so other expenses are now $310 a month. Uh, monthly pay down is probably a little bit more now. Let's say $210 a month, let's say. Uh, but what stays the same, folks? Depreciation amortization. This is assuming, of course, the taxpayer didn't make any capital expenditures. Uh, they would have to depreciate during this time span um, because their basis is their basis. Their basis is what they paid for the property five years ago. And depreciation is based on that. They haven't refined, so their loan costs are the same, same loan costs they paid five years ago. So the depreciation amortization, they haven't changed. Um, so kind of a takeaway here is that time goes by and you increase your rents, and hopefully the, the increase in your rents outpaces the increase in your cash expenses, but that depreciation stays constant, right? And remember, a big driver that tax loss early on is depreciation, but that stays constant. So over time on a typical rental property, you might start seeing taxable income generated by the property because while your rents are going up, your depreciation is staying constant. And on top of that, depreciation doesn't last forever. It lasts a long time, to be sure. Uh, but on a rental property, the, the life is 27 and a half years for depreciation, right? And there's like this mid-month convention. But so say you're 30, um, you're depreciation out, right? Other than depreciation on perhaps a little bit of capital improvements you made over the year, but the bulk, but the bulk of the depreciation is done. So back uh, to our, fa our fact pattern here in this third scenario, now this rental property is gener generating taxable income of $300 a year. Um, let's say the taxpayer is in the 24% tax bracket, so 24% times $300 is 72 bucks. Not a whole lot in the grand scheme of things, but if we're talking about you know more properties and scaling all that, this could be more of a tax liability, right? But I do want to point something out here, and that is that even though this property uh, generated in this scenario $1,908 in cash flow, um, and on top of that $2,520 in principal pay down, which is a net worth increase, right? That's your tenants paying down your mortgage for you. So let's just, you know, say back of the napkin here, $4,500 in economic increase during the year. And that's not even including appreciation of the value of the property itself, but only the cash flow and the principal pay down. But on all that, that $4,500, your taxable income attributable to the property, it's not $4,500, it's only 300 bucks. And your tax bill is only 72 bucks. That's pretty incredible. So my point is, if you make good money, and you don't qualify as a real estate professional. I will make a video on real estate professional status at some point in the future. But given this fact pattern, buying property isn't going to be some magic bullet to lower your tax liability. But if you just isolate the real estate 
and look at the economic benefit you're getting from the real estate itself. Forget about the write-offs against your W-2 income. Just isolating the real estate itself in those depreciable years, right? And assuming the property is a good investment, then what's happening? You are getting outsized economic increase, net worth increase every year far beyond the income taxes you may or may not pay in your real estate activities, okay? So my point is, even though real estate may not necessarily lower, right, your tax liability for the year, the, the tax liability from real estate investing versus the amount of economic increase you're getting from real estate investing, assuming it's a good investment, is actually quite small, right? You're paying, you're getting this much, right? Uh, in principal pay down and appreciation and cash flow, but you're paying this much in taxes, especially in those depreciating years, assuming you made a good investment. So I hope this video is helpful for all of you out there who are uh, thinking about getting into real estate or you, you are in real estate right now, but you don't completely understand all the tax ramifications. Like I said previously, if you're a real estate investor and thinking about getting a CPA or a new CPA, reach out to me, realestate at loganalec.com and we will chat. All right, folks, that's all I have for you today. Uh, feel free to check out this video right over here about one of my favorite forms of passive income. I think you'll really enjoy this video. And I have another tax video for you right down here if you want to learn more about taxes. Thank you so much, folks, and I'll see you in those videos. Bye-bye.